So again, we can visualize the Buddha atop our head. We can pray, right? You know, or visualize yourself surrounded by, um, actually traditionally you visualize yourself surrounded by all sentient beings, right? Usually with your father on your right, mother on the left, friends and relatives behind you, enemies in front and strangers all around. And so you feel, feel like, okay, I'm practicing this practice, you know, of meditation on refuge for myself and also for all these other sentient beings in order to liberate myself and all of them from the oceans of samsara suffering. So you can pray to the Buddha, please help me to become enlightened in particular. Please help me to uh, progress in the realization of meditation on refuge. Actually, you can imagine then that the Buddha is pleased with that request and sends down uh, like a rainbow-like uh, five-colored um, light into your body and bodies of all others with nectar kind of descending along those light beams, nectar made of light. And your body becomes uh, filled with five-colored light nectar. Your body becomes totally purified. <coughs> and you're blessed right, by that nectar to fully realize the practice of refuge. Again, we can kind of begin by contemplating. So with refuge, we always start by contemplating the first of the two points, which is giving rise to fear, uh, healthy fear or appropriate fear, realistic fear. So in this case, <coughs> we can broaden the fear. Right? So we can first we start again with the fear of the lower realm. Right? <coughs> so this <coughs> realistic concern. In this life, I've given rise to so much negative karma. So remember, each time, right, each action of lying, like if it's complete negative karma of lying, right, then that can lead to rebirth in the lower realm. It will actually. That's the main result. Each karma of harsh speech. Each time I've done a complete karma of harsh speech, the main result is rebirth in the lower realm. Divisive speech, right? trying to push people apart <coughs> with my speech, the result is rebirth in the lower realm. And I've engaged in ill will, right? the result is rebirth in the lower realm. With each of the ten non-virtuous actions, right, when I've engaged in them in a kind of complete way, right, I've created so many causes for rebirth in the lower realm. And then just logically, right, I can think, if that's true in this life, when I'm a human being who's met the Dharma, right, who's met perfect kind of teachings and Mahayana teachers and so on, if that's true in this life, then I must, and if, if you know, even where I'm trying to practice it, then I must have done much, much more negative karma in past lives. Hmm. So it's like I have mountains or truckloads of kind of negative karmic seeds for rebirth in the lower realm. The only 
only way I can protect myself from them ripening and an actual rebirth in lower realms is by taking refuge in secret. <coughs> and then not only that, right? So I have so much in each kanda. I have so much karma to grow, grow born in lower realms. But then also the fear of samsara itself, right? Because just even if I can, you know, it's great to not be born in lower realms, but then of course I'm still in samsara. Even you look at the human realm, right? So much suffering. We were talking about addiction. Right? And then, like, terrible, actually. It's not good enough just to not be born in lower realms. Right? If I stay in samsara, right? Lifetime after lifetime. Imagine, ju imagine just for a moment, right? Even the human realm, right? So if, like, you're a parent and your child is a heroin addict and dies, Horrible, right? So imagine yourself, right? You're young, and then you get addicted. Then either you die young, or if you spend your whole life, some people, right? Spend their whole life, years and years, just in that pain. Misery. There's so many kinds of suffering. You know, the human realm is the higher realms, right? But the suffering is unbelievable. So much war. Right? You grow up in a place where there's war. Terrible. Right? Or even if you're like living in a place where there's peace, and then you have depression, panic attacks, or other things. Then your mind can be so. Even if you, you, know, you seem okay externally, but your mind can be so. Right? And even like people who, you know, maybe they have like a nice house. And so if they're having like very bad relationship problems, then in their mind they actually could think, oh, this feels like hell. <coughs> like family problems, relationship problems, it's all. So on the one hand, I'm afraid. We, we just think I'm terrified of falling in lower realms. That's the worst suffering. But even if I go in the higher realms, there's no satisfaction, no safety. So much, so many different kinds of pain and misery and difficulty. Everything that comes together falls apart. There's no in the in samsara there is no rest. Every samsara relationship that comes together, every, what do they say, every meeting ends in parting. Parting in this life or parting at death. Everything I accumulate eventually falls apart. someone's died, like going through their stuff, right? Getting rid of it. There's no satisfaction in some sorrow. No ultimate peace. No real safety. So we can generate this kind of fear now of the lower realms, and also a fear of continuing to be trapped in some sorrow with no control, right? Totally controlled by ignorance and all the other mental afflictions. Like a puppet. I'm just dragged around by my own afflictive emotions, by my own mental afflictions. Right? One sutra says, like, space tied up in knots. Right? I'm like totally trapped my own hallucinations, hallucinated appearances, and delusional thinking and feeling. It's a total prisoner 
to my ignorance and my anger, my desire, my pride, my laziness, my confusion. And there's no way I can free myself from that. I can't even like free myself from rebirth in lower realms much less can I free myself without help from desire, from anger, or f especially not from the ignorance grasping of independent existence. It's impossible. I need help. If I want to have any chance of being free from lower realms and also free from samsara in general, I absolutely need help. So, who in this universe can help me? So, only the three jewels can help with that. Hmm. Only the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha are refuge that can free one from samsara. First of all, just think, contemplate, right? So the Buddha taught, you know, the three higher trainings. Right? He taught ethics or morality. He taught meditative concentration. And he taught the wisdom of understanding emptiness, the ultimate nature of reality. So if I understand those and actualize them in my experience, then I'll become free from samsara, right? an actual refuge. Wow. Only the Buddha explained that. Especially he explained how dependent origination and emptiness uh, don't contradict each other, but how everything is dependently arisen or empty. And how that, how understanding that in meditative experience uproots or destroys ignorance grasping at independent existence which then creates liberation, destroys the cause of suffering, and leads me to liberation. It's like, wow, the Buddha is an actual refuge. He taught the path to liberation from samsara, from all these problems, the problems of hell, hungry ghost realms, animal realms, and all the infinite problems of this human realm. Physical disease, mental disease, relationship problems, addiction, all this. Right? Without realizing the ultimate nature of reality, I'm trapped. I'll just keep taking birth over and over in this samsaric way, right? kind of looking for happiness and finding misery. Only the Buddha explained that. to attain liberation from samsara. And so here, according to the Lamrim, we can just meditate for a few minutes also uh, in terms of faith, right? On the qualities, some of the qualities. First is qualities of the Buddha's body. Right? In the middle of the Lamrim, what does Lakhava mention? Right? The Buddha's body is itself is um, has the marks and examples, right? These qualities of a golden color, beautiful, a beautiful form, right? each feature of which is created by good uh, merit, right? created over eons of time. And the Buddha gave away everything, practiced patience for eons, right? as people who, right? he intentionally sort of practiced patience as people killed him or belittled him or stole his things. Right, just so much generosity in past lives in order to be able to manifest to benefit us. So then the Buddha manifests this body, which itself is a kind of teaching, an inspiration. They say, 
Okay. The sense of like awe-inspiring <coughs> beauty of the Buddha's body, you know, makes one like so one is never tired of looking at it. And just seeing it, it inspires kind of virtuous states of mind. It pacifies the mind. Then the Buddha's speech, which they say um, teaches the Dharma perfectly, precisely in accordance with the needs of each student. That's a kind of beautiful, melodious voice that flawlessly explains the nature of reality. It flawlessly explains just what each student needs to hear to progress. qualities of the Buddha's mind. So the Lama mentions two parts to that. Right? One is the Buddha's wi uh, omniscient wisdom. That only a Buddha knows all of sentient beings' karma. So the Buddha flawlessly, that's, one of the, that's why the Buddha is fearless in benefiting sentient beings. Because the Buddha always knows <coughs> beings' capacity <coughs> to benefit. And the Buddha knows like beings' karmic disposition, and so can flawlessly give us advice that will just suit our mind and our situation. And it says not only, and they, they say like, uh, in terms of omniscience, they say the Buddha knows all existent phenomena the way one knows like an apple in the palm of one's hand. Not only that, they also mention the Lama Ram, that the Buddha has um, also the quality of mind is uh, mentioned as compassion, mercy, kindness, that embraces, <coughs> so you actually think, the Buddha's compassion embraces all sentient beings with infinite compassion. And so you actually think towards everyone, including you, so you actually feel now, including me, that the Buddha feels towards me um, more love. Like if you ever s seen like um, you know, a good mother with a newborn child, like, the Buddha feels more love for me even than that. The Buddha cherishes me even more than that. But the Buddha has a kind of infinite and intense unbearable compassion for every sentient being, including myself. An absolute commitment to my well-being and the well-being of all sentient beings. So the Buddha like vows and manifests limitlessly to benefit. You can actually feel like however much like I can actually think like, of others who have loved oneself in one's life, you know, which is wonderful. Then we actually think, and the Buddha has even more than that kind of love and cherishing and compassion for me, wanting to guide me, to enlighten me, wanting to free me from every kind of suffering. Mm -hmm. And also that the Buddha has limitless activity, as another one of the Buddha's activities, which are spontaneous and uninterrupted, a kind of limitless, compassionate activity. we can feel then, like if I develop faith in my heart, from the Buddha's side, the Buddha's qualities are complete. His compassion, his wisdom are complete. And there's like one text gives an analogy of like, um, like a crane lifting something up, but then there has to be a hook for the crane to hook onto to lift one up. So for me, my faith is that hook, is the ring. The hook can connect to. So the 
Buddha's qualities are complete. And if I develop faith, then all the other good qualities will come from that. If I develop a, a, fa a relationship of faith and a trust in the Buddha, then because the Buddha has wisdom, compassion, skill, through that relationship, I'll be transformed someone liberated from the lower realms, liberated from samsara, even to become a Buddha. So if you contemplate these points, right, if you develop a, the idea is to develop a sense of, again, like uh, faith, I mean, faith is the word we should translate, trust, so it's like a relationship, actually. We're afraid of the sufferings of samsara in general, suffering the lower realms, suffering all the different sufferings of samsara. We turn to the Buddha, who has these qualities of body, of speech, of mind, compassion, or a compassionate activity. We turn with a sense of, like, um, there are different metaphors used. So that for, it's for an emotional experience we're trying to cultivate. One metaphor that's used is like a child, like a young child who's terrified, who runs to their mother or father and, and like jumps into their arms. Another metaphor that's used that I mentioned, right, is like you know, somebody had if somebody had a diagnosis, like of a serious heart condition or cancer or some other frightening condition then the feeling you would have if you found like the best specialist in the world on that to on that thing and they said, oh, I can help you. I have, here's the treatment protocol. Right. A sense of relief and of trust and of relationship. You know, that kind of faith. Not faith like that's distant, but a kind of relational trust, a relational faith. Buddha can help me, can guide me, can protect me. The Buddha has the ability to do that, and the willingness, because of his compassion, and I have a desperate need. So again, we'll take like five minutes of silence just to meditate on those points, just trying to give rise to that kind of a feeling of fear of samsara, and also faith and trust. 